Uba Salpang, a performing artist with Tira Productions, and I'm in the stream. Hi, I'm Femi OK. And I'm Malika Bilal. Editorial cartoons use satire to expose the ridiculous or highlight a truth. As one cartoonist puts it, it's the first punch in a proverbial bar fight. And today's political climate in the United States is ripe with creative fodder for their drawings. But do these cartoons enrich debates or deepen divides? It's here to talk about this, we have in Orange County, California, Michael Ramirez. He's a syndicated editorial cartoonist and co-manager of the editorial page for Investor Business Daily. In Jacksonville, Florida, Mike Lester, a syndicated editorial cartoonist and illustrator. And in Miami, Cynthia and Sam Machado. They are a husband and wife cartoonist and comic book artist team. Hello everybody. Going to start with doing some Googling. Excuse me for Googling. I'm going to type in conservative cartoonists and see what comes up. Aha! Michael! <laughs> Top of the pile <laughs> here. Are you comfortable with that label, Michael? You know I am. I'm an equal opportunity offender. Um, you know, my, my um, philosophy is to go after injustice wherever it stands, so I'm not uh, linked to any party. Um, if you notice in the uh, past political election year, I pretty much had uh, barbs for everyone. Yeah. But I think that's the way political cartooning ought to be. Uh, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's only objective. The objective part of editorial cartooning is, is in the research phase, when you're figuring out with these complex issues what the long-term consequences are going to be. Once you establish that, it becomes a very subjective uh, profession. In fact, I always find it funny when people call me up and they say, you know, you're way too opinionated. And I have to say, well, that's why we're on the opinion page. Is it successful? Is it successful cutting when you've truly, truly upset somebody? Well, you know, I don't think you go out of your way to try to uh, upset people. I mean, you don't yeah. do uh, humorous cartoons for the sake of humor in the same way you don't do controversial cartoons for the sake of controversy. Yeah. You're trying to make a profound impact in the political debate that's going on in the political arena. When you think about it, political cartoons are sort of like the advertising that you see in the Super Bowl. you got five seconds to capture the viewer's attention, uh. five seconds to deliver the point, a profound point. But the profound point of the editorial cartoon is the most important element. That's what distinguishes us from other cartooning. It's a it's a trade of journalism. See, Mike Lester, you're, you describe yourself as hot right now in the, in the world of cartooning. Why are you hot right now in the world of cartooning? Mike that's Lester. News to me. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's news to me, but I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Um, <laughs> by, the way, by the way, if you scroll down that page, that Google page, Yeah. I don't think there's a second page of conservative cartoons. No, there, there are about three or four, depending on what day I actually Google it. You are up there on that list. Um, I, I'm just thinking about what it is when you're sitting down to do a cartoon. Are you thinking, wh where's the politics in that list of things that you need to achieve in a cartoon? Not at all. I'm thinking about the reader's experience. Mm -hmm. I, when someone goes to my page or goes, opens up the newspaper and sees uh, uh, my opinion, well, first of all, um, it's, it's important to let people who don't know a lot about political cartoons that we rely on the media uh, to familiarize the reading public with a particular issue. And so um, it doesn't do us or me any good to opine on an issue nobody's ever heard of. Um, I find that out early in the hard way. <laughs> but um, I, I, I definitely, I think it's with my years in advertising, I, I always try to think of um, the experience the reader's going to have. And I definitely go out of my way to try to think or do something that they've probably never seen before. Um, that's not easy to do. Um, it's not easy to do uh, for any of us on this panel. But it's, it's, it's kind of what drives me when I sit down at my desk. Showing people that they may not have seen before uh, is something that might describe what I'm about to show you. So we got a video comment from uh, another cartoonist who would describe himself as conservative, uh, Tony Branco. This is uh, one piece of his work. This is a tweet. Trump was awesome today. I've waited most of my life to see that. Media popularity is going down. And you can see in the cartoon there, uh, Trump is saying, any more questions? And there's the New York Times, there's NBC, CBS, CNN, ABC, all kind of fried from his wrath. So this is what he told us about why there aren't more people with his perspective out there. Have a listen. 
Well, the mainstream media or the press is predominantly left. So, of course, you're going to get more of a left-leaning, liberal type person attracted uh, to that environment. And that goes for uh, cartoonists as well. Sam, what do you make of that argument? Do you think that's true? No, I don't. I think uh, one of the biggest problems we have as cartoonists is uh, very much what uh, uh, Mike Lester was saying and what Michael was saying. We want to distill the argument down to a one panel cartoon that speaks to everybody and that has something to say, communicates uh, uh, some feeling and an idea. So this is extremely difficult to do, I think, um, sometimes coming from the right, because there's uh, talking points that uh, you have to hit on, and these talking points don't always make great arguments. So it's really difficult, I think, to make a good argument sometimes from, from, from the right. And I commend, you know, our right uh, uh, cartoonists who are doing it. Let me just show one of your cartoons here. This is on my laptop. Thea, tell me more about this. What was going on when you were putting this together? Ooh. Intrigue. Uh, <laughs> basically, anything in our political system that even looks or sounds like this image feels to us, there has to be something wrong. Um, when I look at this, when I did this cartoon, when we came up with this cartoon, there was just so much secrecy and so much, so many things that were hidden. Um, and we felt that it was better to go ahead and show it and distill it in one image than it was to go ahead and try and write about it. Um, because there's so much there that needs to be discussed. Um, and visually speaking, it's, it's funny. <laughs> so um, we get people on the lab. Mike Lewis, is you know, that... That's a, is, is, yeah, go, go ahead, Michael, go ahead. You know, that, that's a terrific cartoon. And... Uh, but, but I'm going to disagree a little with the, with Sam on the statement about conservative cartoonists. I think I think uh, Tony is is right. When you think about political cartoonists, and, and I separate that entity from you know people that just draw humorous anecdotes about politics and people that are actually editorialists that use an illustrative form. Uh, we're basically just like any other columnist, uh, you know, uh, on the left and the right. Uh, the only difference is we use a visual dialogue to do our job. And when you look at journalism as a trade and a profession, I think Tony's correct. I mean, I, I've been, you know, I worked at the LA Times, I worked at USA Today, I worked at the Memphis Commercial Appeal. The vast majority of journalism is dominated by more liberal thinkers. I don't, I don't believe in a broad liberal conspiracy or, or anything like that, but I think we are far outnumbered. And I think Mike could probably tell you that uh, you know we have our trade organizations, and when you go into an editorial cartoonist meeting, that the, uh, the the right is vastly outnumbered than the left. But the approach should be the same. You know, you look at these things objectively and decide how you feel philosophically from your foundation, whether these are going to have dire consequences or good consequences, and then you opine with an illustration. You know, it's not it, it's not necessarily just conservative or liberal, but it should be profound in the way that you present it. So you mentioned consequences, and I, and I want to go to you with that because that made my ears perk up. Because sometimes the consequences are you are actually lampooning or satirizing someone you know. That's uh, yeah. something we got out of a video comment from Gary Varvel. He's a cartoonist out of Indianapolis. Have a listen to what he told us. I'm Gary Varvel, the editorial cartoonist for the Indianapolis Star and Creator Syndicate. Someone once said an editorial cartoonist is a guy who walks into a bar, throws the first punch, and then sits back and watches while everybody dukes it out. Editorial cartoonists are visual commentators, and our opinions come from our worldview. For instance, I'm a Christian, a conservative, constitutionalist, and a cartoonist. We don't cheerlead for politicians, even the ones we agree with. And I feel my job is to stay independent from politicians. For instance, I was friends with Mike Pence long before he went into politics. When he told me he was running for Congress, I politely distanced myself from him because I can't be close to someone I might be drawing about. So, Michael Ramirez, does that sound familiar? You were friends with a former, uh, a former governor, governor of Tennessee, correct? Right. When I, when I was at the Memphis Commercial Appeal, I was uh, uh, Don Sunquist, who was governor at the time, was a very good friend of mine. And, and, you know, Gary's a great guy. I don't have that problem because I'm inherently evil. 
<laughs> and so uh, I could be close to politicians and still be completely objective. And there are times when uh, Don would do something, or when Governor Sunquist would do something that I vehemently disagreed with, and I would do a cartoon on it, and we'd get together for lunch or dinner, and he'd ask me why I did the cartoon, and I'd say, you know, Don, uh, if you don't want me to do cartoons on things, there's an easy solution. Just call me up before you do anything. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? I, I think, uh, you know, it depends on your personal approach, whether you want to be close to politicians or not. You know, I was friends with Al Gore as well. Um, I like to know these people. I want to be able to ask Michael, them you questions. Said you said you were friends with Al Gore. Did you stop being friends after you started cartooning him? <laughs> well, you know, I was friends with Al when he was a senator in Tennessee, oh. but we don't really keep in touch right. that much. But uh, you know, he's a terrific guy. We philosophically degree, uh, disagree on a lot of issues. Um, but uh, no, if he wants to give me a call and, and uh, set up solar panels on my house, he's welcome anytime. Mike, I'm just wondering how rich this is in terms of material for you, this Trump presidency. I'm looking here on my laptop uh, about travel. That was your parents. They just boarded their flight. How they get through security so fast? So that's one panel. The other panel, uh, uh, ladies wearing burkas, having a, a more difficult time of getting through. Now, when you put stuff out like that, are people genuinely upset or are they celebrating? What's your audience? Do you know? I kind of thought that was kind of a funny cartoon, and that's the reaction I got. Um, I'm really an equal opportunity offender as well. Um, I'm not very I'm, I'm not very fond of describing my cartoons. I just kind of feel like they're speak that they speak them for themselves. Sure. If if sure. if you want to know my my uh, my uh, my feeling about uh, well, we were talking about politicians. I know that many politicians. Thea, Thea just gave Sam a look. Her look was <laughs> right. Thea, I, I'm just going to recreate it because we weren't on you when you were doing that look. And what was behind that look when you saw that? Because this is, well, this is, this is the I, area well, I, that we're in right now. About, I stopped to think about why it is that we say we don't want to know politicians in that way. I mean, everybody's looking at this in a standpoint of we want to be popular as cartoonists. I want to say what I want to say. That's ultimately my goal. Um, you know, whether it's left or right, conservative or not, you know, there are certain views that I have that are conservative, and there are many of them, but <laughs> they exist. And I happen to be with someone who's a lot more conservative than I am in a lot of views. So, you know, at what point do we draw the line and say, we want to say what we want to say. We just want to say it in this particular format. Um, well, when you say you want to draw, where to draw the line, that's an odd thing to say for an editorial cartoonist, because I don't think there are any. I don't believe in the word free speech, but there is no but after free speech. Do you find yourself Wait. editing your, your own work? Do you find yourself saying, I don't know if this is what I want to say? No, I don't. I'm, I'm pretty, um, I kind of shoot from the hip. I have uh, people in DC who, uh, who their job is to reel me in and they have saved my bacon many, many times. Give us an example, uh, Mike. How did they save you? Let's see. Um, after Trump made his comment about enemy of the people, um, Chuck Todd was offended and went on Twitter. And Chuck and Dodd. Chuck Todd is an NBC news anchor, news presenter, newsman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, and I had Chuck Todd coming out. I had Chuck Todd doing what is America's known as the Walk of Shame. I don't know if I can explain that to your to your viewers if they don't want to know what it is. <laughs> but, uh, I think they might. Uh, he was was the world. I, I had him leaving um, a, a cheap motel room, <laughs> heading to a, ca a cab. This has only been four or five days ago. You can probably scroll back and find it. And on the side of the cab, it said Trump. He's holding his clothes. And on the door, it said 44 with one of the, na one of the numbers crooked. And I had written Obama. And my, my, my uh, editor said, you know, Chuck Todd was a big um, critic of Obama's. And sent me some things uh, to, to back that up. So we changed it to the left. I would, I would have not known that because, you know, I'm lazy and I didn't do the research, but. <laughs> well, the point is that you had a knee-jerk reaction to I it, which is. I don't her name is Lago, so I should give her credit where credit is due. 
So, let me so jump I want to bring in our I want to bring in our community because they're watching you guys have this conversation and they have so much to say. This is uh, Thistle who says artwork is a necessary part of the political discourse and complex issues can be broken down in a simple way for people to understand them. That's her reasoning uh, for the popularity and the necessity of editorial cartoons. So let me show you. One of those, just just an example, and you've seen it uh, on the columns behind me. You've seen it flash on your screens. Thea and Sam, this is your cartoon. Um, you can explain it for us, but I, I just want to point this question out before you do. We got this tweet from so-called liberal. That's the handle, and they want to know if you're getting quote unquote alt right pushback and threats from that cartoon. What do you say? Not that. Not that I'm inviting any, but no. Um, actually, okay. the response has been uh, very, very positive. So and, tell, uh, tell us what went into to making this. Well, I think I had a very knee-jerk reaction, very much the way Mike had a very knee-jerk reaction to something that he saw on television. I actually oh, came up with bad. the cartoon idea about a week before I drew it. I wanted to draw it immediately upon hearing about the... Uh, the executive order uh, uh, regarding the uh, the ban on certain countries. And Sam reeled me back a little bit, said, we need to go ahead and just wait. <laughs> wait until there's actually been a decision made. Um, and so I waited at least one week, and a week later we, we posted it. Um, and it's been very positive ever since. Yeah, this was one of those cartoons where I didn't, uh, I didn't have too much to say on the design, I, I came in there and I did very little work to it. I, I adjusted, you know, arms and, and, and suggested color and body language changes. But this was in Thea from the moment she heard about uh, the band, and she was just, you know, chomping at the bit to get this out. <laughs> Let me just go back to Michael Ramirez via his crapshoot cartoon here, Michael. Um, you've been around as a cartoonist for a while, so you've seen lots of different kinds of administrations. Is this one a very rich one for cartoons and material and, and political riffing? I, I, I think it will be. Uh, and, and, uh, I, I'm going to go Michael Ramirez and then Mike. I'm going to come back to you, Mike. Just let me just finish <laughs> with Michael Ramirez one, one moment. You know, I, I think they're always target rich environments. Yeah. I mean, uh, I can't say that, uh, well, I, I can say I probably preferred a few uh, more liberal administrations to conservative ones, but you yeah. can always find criticism there. But let, I want to step back to you, the previous uh, exchange that we had, because I agree sure. with both Thea and Mike Lester. I think Thea is correct. We're not populists. That's not the job of the uh, political cartoonists to be popular or to draw things that are popular. You know, we're editorialists. And... Uh, we were supposed to be demonstrating the conviction of our beliefs, and we utilized the visual medium to do it. And and, uh, and to Mike Lester, I mean, I think we ought to have the freedom uh, to to deliver whatever we want. Free speech is such an important element in a, uh, in a self governing democratic republic, which is you know we have the uh, the blessings of being in the United States where we have these kinds of constitutional freedoms, and and I believe in those absolutely, but. There is a portion in editorial cartooning where you have to take responsibility for what you say. And like what Michael was saying, you substantiate your point of view before you even put pen to paper. And part of the process is deciding what to draw and also what not to draw. Let me give you an example. Uh, when Johnny Cochran died, you know, Johnny Cochran was the lawyer that defended O.J. Simpson. And there, uh, there was a vast majority of the people that believed that he got a murderer off on this uh, criminal appeal. And uh, one of the, the, uh, the initial ideas that came to mind was uh, Johnny Cochran at the Gates of Heaven. And St. Peter was saying, I'm sorry, Johnny, but if the halo don't fit, we don't admit. Which was actually a tribute to something that was said during the, the trial. The line that would probably was the most, uh, uh, the, the biggest element of the trial that got O.J. Simpson off, which was the glove. If the glove doesn't fit, we don't admit. Now, after researching Johnny Cochran's um, life and the things that he had done in his career, uh, he was a very, very generous man. He'd done very many charitable things. And I felt it was unfair to paint him with one brush yeah. on this one incident that defined his career. So I didn't do the cartoon. Except, that, I think, except Michael, that Thea was laughing as you were describing your cartoon that you actually didn't do. Thea was yeah. actually laughing. She, she thought it was funny. 
Well, you know, it is a funny cartoon. It has a yeah. profound statement. Yeah. But the question is, does Johnny Cochran deserve to be defined by that one mm -hmm. element? Mm -hmm. And in that circumstance, I did. It's the same reason why when the space shuttle Challenger exploded, uh, there was a lot of stories about NASA cutting corners sure. and, and cutting on safety that resulted in this terrible disaster. <clears throat> and I thought of an idea where I had these pieces of the shuttle going across the sky with a bubble coming out of one of the pieces saying, man, these NASA cutbacks are killing us. It makes a profound and dramatic point that seven American heroes died that day. And, and really, you would lose the, the effect of the cartoon over the controversy of whether or not you should use that image. Yeah. You know, we have one shot to try to inform people and to try to sway them over to our point of view. You don't want to have it mired in a controversial element of the cartoon that really is going to take away from the point you're trying to make. Michael, it seems like a good point for me to share this with people, just to remind them of a cartoon that kind of blew up last week. And this was the U.S. Secretary of Education, uh, Betsy DeVos. This is a Norman Rockwell, very famous painting here. And the juxtaposition between the two, that upset people a lot. And that was done, that cartoon was done by Glenn McCoy. We got in touch with Glenn to ask him about the fallout from this. And he was saying that some are saying that my cartoon was comparing apples to oranges. And these people never complain about endless cartoons depicting Trump's Hitler or Republicans to Nazis. Last I checked, President Trump hasn't exterminated six million European Jews. And I'm just clicking on to Mike Lewis's Twitter page here. And, and Mike, you were, you were saying that, that Glenn was a, a friend of yours, a mate of yours. I'm just wondering whether is it worth that kind of fallout um, and uh, is that something that you feel is that's part of your job as an editorial cartoonist to take the heat? Because he's taking a lot of heat right now. Absolutely. Yeah, he, yeah, he is. And the question becomes, are we black Americans, are we white Americans, are we Asian Americans, are we, you know, it, it is my opinion, and I'm not going to speak for Glenn, but I would, I would think he'd say we're American Americans. Now, I, he, he took a piece of um, black iconography uh, when, um, I'm sorry, Ruby... Uh, Bridges. What was the little girl? Bridges. Bridges, excuse me, Ruby Bridges. Um, and the um, and, and the painting, that Nor the famous painting Norman Rockwell did. Um, I, I'm not sure why, had he been a black man? And put uh, Hillary Clinton in that in that position, he'd be practicing his Pulitzer speech right now. Or if he'd been a white man and done that, but he he was vilified for using, by uh, if I understood Whoopi Goldberg correctly, he appropriated black culture, and uh, the. Uh, the her heroism of a of a six year old girl. Let me just check in with with Thea. Thea. So no, no problem with that. Thea, we're right at the end of this show. What, what was your just comment to leave us on before we go to that post show? Well, uh, my comment to that is that the comparison made between those two images, although you know, we have to go ahead and look at it from the standpoint of apples and oranges because that's exactly what it really stood for. Um, Betsy DeVos, the six-year-old child had to go into a school uh, where, she, you know, she did not have any kind of a voice up until this point. Sure. Betsy DeVos quite obviously has a voice. All right, she Cynthia, you have it. a voice, Sam has a voice, Mike Lester, Mike Ramirez, we're taking all of you to our online post show. It's online, stream.outofzero.com. See you there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our online post show. I'm just wondering if there are particular cartoons that really get under people's skin. Then you've done a, a good job. People aren't supposed to like all of your cartoons, are they? No, absolutely not. You know, no? You're supposed to upset people. Not if you're doing your job. Right. <laughs> I don't know if you're supposed to upset people, but, you know, you're supposed to talk to people and you're supposed to be authentic. If what you have to say genuinely upset somebody, you want to hear what they're upset about. 
you want to know why they're upset. This is about conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the job of the fourth estate. We want to, we want to, we want to talk. We want to resist a little bit, but we want to talk a lot. Look, politics is divisive. You know, people are emotionally invested in their politics, and frankly, that's the way it ought to be. Uh, you you ought to really uh, bear these things with your inner being and support them uh, completely. I, I I think it's up to the editorial cartoonists to be careful and substantiate their point of view. But once they do that, then they, I think they have every right to espouse whatever belief they want. It, it's like the Charlie Hedbo uh, killings that happened. You know, um, it was a quote that's attributed to Voltaire, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the, to the death your right to say it. It was actually Evelyn Beatrice Hall who, who uh, made that quote. But uh, that's absolutely true. You know, the, uh, the, the thing about editorial cartooning is, is the same as journalism, this freedom of speech uh, that, that we cherish here. Uh, that goes beyond the boundaries sometimes. I, I frankly like it, uh, like Mike Lessard said, open to everyone. And, uh, you know, the speech itself will diminish the person giving the speech if it's something that's bad. I would like to be open to all of it because it's free exchange of information that we have, this valuable communication of ideas and information, you know, the right to, to inform and be informed. It's a necessary component in, in, our, in our constitutional liberty, liberty and self-governance. So I, I want to broaden this out. Just to, I want to give us a little bit of international perspective here because people are watching you guys from all over the world as we have this conversation. So this is Jasmine out of New Zealand. She says, cartoonists have the guts to say stuff that we don't, we being the rest of us who aren't cartoonists. They can hold us and society to account. It's uncomfortable sometimes, but it's necessary. So uh, along those lines of this being an international conversation, I want to play you a video comment we got from an international cartoonist out of the Netherlands. Have a listen. We've seen a flood of cartoons ever since uh, the election outcome. Uh, but we've also seen in, in recent weeks uh, a kind of fatigue that's beginning to set in, especially among international cartoonists. Um, we're kind of done with the subject. And I'm, I also think it has to do with the fact that uh, when you're an international cartoonist, uh, you have to do Trump in a, a broader sense. You can't really get down to the nitty gritty of U.S. politics because uh, your audience wouldn't understand it. So you're forced to take on the broad subjects like liberty, like uh, Trump's uh, relationship with the press. And at some point, after hundreds and hundreds of cartoons, you know, you're, you're just exhausted. There's nothing more in the subject matter for you to cartoon about. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing now. Sam and Thea, I know that you guys are really just getting started on your political work of your cartooning. Do you see fatigue ever setting in? Uh, I would actually say that the more I watch, the more I want to draw. Uh, I would not say that this has all started during the inauguration night. So, no, I don't see any fatigue in this. And actually, that's not the experience we're having in this country. So um, I understand that cartoonists um, in other countries have other things to say. Um, and I actually have a lot of things that I want to hear about what's going on in those other countries. Because I think that, in a sense, America is actually in its own echo chamber right now. Um, we're only hearing our own stories. We're not hearing the stories of refugees that are suffering in other countries and the countries that are taking them in. So I think it's really important for us to go ahead and bring about more communication with international cartoonists, and better yet, to do it on a lap. Yeah, I don't see myself uh, running out of material for a little while now. Uh, in fact, I don't have enough time to get all my material out. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm amazed at uh, international cartoonists and how bold they are. I mean, what we take for granted here in America that we have the freedom to, to speak and say our mind. I remember when I was visiting Cuba and I met a bunch of cartoonists who couldn't draw Fidel Castro or Che Guevara. And when you look to other countries where, where cartoonists are in prison, I mean, it's very bold and courageous for these cartoonists to say their opinion. And I'm a little bit selfish. Here in the United States, I think it's our job to remind people that the government works for the people, that uh, even though Donald Trump is president of the United States, he's a public servant. And our job is to ensure that there's justice, that these people, you know, uh, we, we've heard the, uh, the old adage that uh, power can turn people into monsters. It's editorial cartoonists' job to turn these monsters uh, back into human beings so that they understand the people are watching and to help hold them accountable for what they do. Sure. You know, and a, a good editorial cartoon ought to be a catalyst for thought. 
so that we could have this pub public debate about all these issues which are going to affect them and the, their children and generations beyond us. Mike's right. We have a we have a responsibility. I'm glad you I'm glad you put up. I believe his name was uh, and catch his last name, and I don't know how to pronounce T J E E R E D. But I'm glad to see his work and glad to, to be familiarized with with um, with someone over there. I don't know a lot of it, international people, but I'm, I very feel very strongly. In fact, I, I have a lot of the fights we were talking about earlier with my editors. I I, I do that because I feel um, we are so blessed to be here and to say things. Um, that do make people uncomfortable. That um, this is the this is the only place on the on the planet um, that uh, is built on that premise. It's the First Amendment for a reason. Everything else falls behind it, and we don't have freedom of speech for stuff that makes you that, that you want to hear. Freedom of speech is for stuff you don't want to hear, and there's a lot I don't want to hear. But but it's, it's it is the, it's the bedrock of our society. <laughs> But, you know, you know Mike, and, and this, this this idea of universal freedom of speech has been around for four centuries. You know, from Marquis de Lafayette, uh, even in 1948, the, the uh, international community passed a law to say that we ought to have this universal freedom of speech, which is very important uh, because we want to hold these people accountable. And the cartoonists that don't have that freedom, they have the courage to stand up for their convictions. But that's why here in the, in the United States, I, I believe firmly that editorial cartooning is a part of real journalism. You know, what we're doing is the fourth branch of government to assure that these people are being held accountable for what they do. Uh, what was it that uh, Jefferson said? Our liberty depends on the freedom of the press, and that cannot be limited without it being lost. And when you think about these, these people, they're just human beings. They're our government, but they're human beings. And I always love this Einstein quote, which is, uh, two things are infinite the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. As long as you're going to have people they're running things, they're going to do something that you disagree with. And that's why we have to have journalists and editorial cartoonists to, to hold them to account for what they do. Let me just share this what? with our audience, uh, Michael. It's, uh, uh, I'm just going to let people look at it on my laptop. There you go. Have a look at that. On my laptop. Oh, yes. Right there. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> If that was a headline, what would that headline be? I mean, the cartoon is all there, Michael, but you were saying you are doing journalism. So is this irreverent <laughs> journalism? Is this turning, flipping the script journalism? What would this be? Well, I think it's truthful journalism. Obamacare is doomed to failure would be the headline. And uh, the only difference right now is we're transitioning from who's going to control it. I'm thinking about your source material, um, Mike Lester. What is it that you consume that keeps you on top of everything so that then you can then put it into an editorial cartoon. What are you watching? What are you reading? What are you consuming? I channel hop in the mornings okay. over coffee and then um, newspapers, um, websites. Um, Which websites? My own newspaper, on? Washington Post. Um, right. It's got to be, there has to be a, every news cycle, there's some familiar, there are issues that people are familiar with. So you really, on any given day, uh, you really have, um, unless you're going to do some broad um, issue uh, that's in the news, um, you really kind of have a handful of topics on which to comment. Thea and I look all over the place. We look at uh, The Economist and we look at uh, The New York Times, The Washington the Guardian. Post, The Guardian, mm -hmm. and we work with Tajir uh, uh, from the cartoon movement a lot, actually. So we try to get a really broad spectrum view sure. uh, uh, of the climate and figure out, you know, uh, uh, what we have to say about it. It's so much more important today than it ever has been before because we, again, we have become almost an echo chamber in our own country. We only hear our own news. We need to be more open as to what the international community is actually saying and actually experiencing based on what we're doing in this country. Yeah, you know, so I, I think part of, uh, Go ahead. Part, part of any job as a journalist is to uh, be informed. Uh, I read four papers a day and I, I go through all the different websites. One, one of the things I encourage uh, people is if there's something that you firmly believe in, 
that uh, you got to just take a chance and read something that's the opposite point of view. And either way, it gives you a broader context of the issue, which I think is important. And, uh, you know, one responsibility, and I hate to keep on bringing it back to the United States, but one responsibility that we have in this country is the, the responsibility to be informed. And especially if you're going to be throwing your opinion out there, it ought to be an informed opinion, I think. I think our community would agree with you. I'm going to read this tweet uh, from Sarcastic Guitarist. Uh, uh, that's the name of his handle. Um, and basically, he says, nothing speaks louder than cartoons, as every bit of the message is clearly depicted. Just read between the lines and enjoy the humor. So I'm going to let you do that with this next tweet. I'm moving over here to this one. This is from an editorial cartoonist. Her name is Liza Donnelly. And you see here, this is one of the uh, press briefings that happened daily at the White House. This. I'm going to imagine is Sean Spicer, uh, the, the White House uh, spokesman. Uh, trust, trust, trust is coming out of his mouth, and whether or not you agree with what you what he is saying and you believe you can trust it is debatable. But here's what Liza told us about what she thinks about when she makes these editorial cartoons. Have a look. I think my role as a political cartoonist is to shine light on things that maybe people aren't seeing. Um, you know, anytime we do a drawing, uh, people. Are attracted to it because people love cartoons. So I think we have a responsibility to uh, take our role seriously. Um, and I, I try not to ridicule for ridicule's sake, but I've done it. Um, people on the internet have told me that my cartoons make them feel a little less alone, which is nice to hear. So I think cartooning is a dialogue. Lovely place to end this conversation, Femi. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. We really enjoyed your company today. Take care, everybody. Thanks.